Great man, we spent with him uh, last night. His name is Dr. Rick Goodman. Rick is the author of Living a Championship Life, A Game Plan for Success. You have his book at your seat. It's been widely acclaimed since its release. Rick has worked with companies of all sizes, from small businesses to Fortune 500 companies. His high energy content rich keynotes, seminars and workshops are designed for associations and firms of all sizes that want to maximize their potential. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Rick Goodman. Thank you, Tony. Stay up here a second. I, I want you to know that Tony is a legend. Some of you don't know this. Tony, exactly. That, he's got a familiar face. Tony has been a sportscaster for going 40 years. I watch Tony every night, sometimes on the weekends when he'd show up, and to be able to have him introduce me is amazing. Uh, so you have a legend here, and you guys probably didn't even know about We're it. Gonna, I'm going to leave now. So. OK. <laughs> Give him a round of applause. All right, so today we're going to have a lot of fun. At least I'm going to have fun. So when I have fun, I hope you have fun also. I want to find out right now, how many of you deal with difficult people every day? Raise your hands. How many of you are difficult people? Keep your hands up. I know there's a whole bunch of you out there. Have you ever had a challenge with someone because you're talking to them and they're not getting it? Has that ever happened before? See, because we all hear things differently based on our scripts, based on what I call MFTP. Mother, father, teacher, preacher. These are the people who said children should be seen, not heard. Don't speak and so spoken to. Rich people are thieves. All the stuff that you heard. That's really not true. So, but that's our record. That's how we perceive things. So when we get involved in a conflict situation with someone who's looking at stuff from a different standpoint than we are, maybe they had different references, different cultures, that's where conflict starts to happen. And what we want to do is get people to connect on a more effective basis. And when we get to communicate more effectively with them, they get it. It's kind of like, how many of you have got children? Raise your hands. OK. How many of you have turned dumb overnight? Anybody? OK, like the children are much smarter than you. I've got two. Uh, my, son's my son's 24. My daughter's 19. Uh, sometimes I look at them and I say, does it say stupid up here? Now, I know I'm going to make a comeback. And the funny thing is, you give them advice. And they don't always listen to your advice, do they? But their best friend tells them the same exact thing and it's the gospel. Anybody been there? So my son called me up the other day. He said, Dad, you know, i got to tell you something. I learned a lot about people. You learn a lot more from listening than speaking. Said, wow, Alex, that's pretty profound. He's like, yeah, Dad, it's amazing. I said, do you remember Grandma Mimi? She said, two ears and one mouth to listen twice as much as you speak. See, I could tell if I'm over the phone, if you're smiling, if you're laughing, if you're paying attention, if you're eating. I feel that. And when we get in front of people, we tend to shut off some of our senses. And we start to miss what they're saying. We miss some of the words. How many of you have ever had someone say, you know what, I'm a, you're having a big party. I'm going to try to make it over. Anybody ever have that happen? Did they ever show up? No, because they said they're going to try. There's no such thing. Take a CD, stick it in your car, try to turn it on. You can't. You either turn it on or you don't turn it on. And when you give them a task to do, they say they'll try to get it. And they are telling you they're not going to. And then they don't do it. You're upset. But they told you in advance. So we need to start listening to some of the words that people are communicating with us. And also, we've got to make sure to look at the words that we're communicating with. Because some of those words can turn somebody on their side right away. And you never know where it's going to come from. At home, my fiance, uh, Liz, she's, she's uh, from Brooklyn originally. Her parents are right off the boat from Cuba. So she's first generation American. And I'll say, you know, that guy was really smart. She'll look at me and say, what am I, stupid? You're kidding me? So right away. Now, was it about her or was it about me? Okay? It's just making a comment. So sometimes we're primed and we're ready to look to, boom, get on somebody. We've got to make sure that we're listening for what's not being said. And that's very, very important in handling a conflict situation. Now, what I'll tell you is people do business with people who they like who are like them. So let me get this slide going here. All right. Doo -doo -doo. There we go. So people do business with people who they like or like or just like them. So think about this. Do you work with people that are friends of yours or do you work with people that are completely opposite of you? Are we moving? Let's see. We'll figure it that way. Now we got it. Sure I got the right clicker? Or 
Roland. Come, cl come click me while I keep going. So what I say is people do business with people who they like who are like them. You will go spend a couple dollars more with a friend of yours than go to a local discount place, won't you? So what we want to do is try to build those people, build a culture around our companies of people that we like to spend time with. Doesn't that make more sense? And if not, we've got to also train them and give them those references on why they should be doing things, let's say, the ultimate way. And I got to tell you, I spent last night with the ultimate team, and the one thing that I noticed was the personalization of the culture. That, you know, you could pick up the phone and get any one of them on the phone. And that's real important to me because that's, I'm that person. I want to be, get them right on the phone. I don't like to have, uh, get on and have answering machines answer or, or the, I called American Airlines and it's say uh, the automatic thing. I always hit zero. Please. And you know, if you raise your voice, then it recognizes your voice and it will actually go right to a person. It's like this person's stressed out. See, I read USA Today yesterday and it said one third of Americans are stressed out. And they said the reason that they were stressed out was the other two-thirds of Americans. <clears throat> so it's not about is conflict going to happen, because conflict's going to happen and it's good. It's about how you respond, and that's the key. When we react, it's negative. It comes from emotion. And sometimes it comes from pent-up emotion, where things are in there and all of a sudden, bleh, we have a dump. And we just, everything comes out. I'm going to give you something you need to write this down. This could be the most profound thing I say all day today. And when I say something profound, I'll try to let you know. And here it is. The tongue has no eraser. The tongue has no eraser. What you say, once you say it, it comes out. I could tell you, my dad used to say, you'll never go to college. All you'll do is chase skirts and play hockey. And he was right. I chased skirts. I played hockey at Kent State University. He's been dead for years, but that is still in my mind. That's that reference point. That's why I do more than I can possibly do. It's like proving them wrong. Now, some people are out there, they're rebels. I'm like George Costanza, Mr. Opposite. I'm that rebel. I see what everybody else is doing, I do the opposite, because everybody else would be successful. Sometimes you got to do something a little bit different. And what I'm going to tell you is opportunities are right in front of your face all the time. But you know what we're doing? We're putting out fires here. We're not looking out here to create the opportunities or the possibility thinking. Asking yourself the question, what if? What if this would work? What would it look like? How could we make this happen? When you start to ask yourself the right questions, you're going to start to get the right answers. A lot of us wake up and we'll say, you know what, it's going to be one of those days. Has anybody ever been there before? So it's going to be one of those days. And mom and grandma said bad things happen in threes. Anybody know, have mom and grandma like that? So you woke up and it was like one, two, three, four, five, five. They just kept coming. And you walked over to your friend at the end of the day and said, Christina, see, <laughs> I was right. I knew it was going to be one of those days. So here's my question. What did you ever get for being right? Now, if you got something, let me know. Because I'm, I think I'm right all the time. I haven't gotten anything yet. See, we want to make sure that we're getting people moving in the direction that we want them to be moving. And when you focus on something, you're going to attract that. If you focus on this employee is not going to communicate effectively with me, or how many of you woken up in the morning and you knew you were in for that con confrontation? And you said, I'm going to say this, and she's going to say this, I'm going to say this, she's going to say this. You got yourself all worked up. You went into work, and nothing happened. Anybody ever been there before? It's called fear, false evidence appearing real. 95% of things you worry about never happen. But you stress and you work yourself up to that point as if it's going to happen. So sometimes we've got to just kind of sit back because we'll attract those things. It's no different than, how many of you bought a new car recently? Anybody bought a new car recently? I guarantee you the moment you got in that car, you started driving around town, it seemed like everybody in town was driving that car, right? There were hundreds of them on the road. You know why? Because your brain was going on search to make you right. Saying, oh, that guy or gal's one smart cookie. They've got the same car as he. They must be doing the right thing. I made the right decision. So how you put that out there, how you start your day, how you accomplish these things, a lot of it has to do with how you look at things and how you're responding versus reacting. What are you saying in your self-talk? What are you saying to yourself? Because that's what really drives communication, conflict, love. It's what you say to yourself. 
How do you see yourself? See, every day I wake up, I say the same thing. I've been saying it for 25 years, and I will make sure to get this information to you. I say I'm a healthy, vital, active, happy, and successful human being. I affirm today that all tissues and organs in my body are functioning perfectly, and that's the way it's supposed to be. I am more relaxed than ever before because I choose peaceful, loving thoughts and release my fears, worries, and anxieties. Tension is gone because I'm creating an atmosphere of ease and confidence. My mind is uncluttered because I've set specific goals and planned action steps for their accomplishment. I feel better now. Nature uses the food that I eat, the air that I breathe, the water that I drink, and the rest that I get to rebuild, repair, and revitalize me for the future. Radiant energy flows through me. I also affirm today that money is plentiful and an abundant supply, and this money flows freely and constantly into my life as I render loving service to all mankind. What do you say? Oh, I got to go to this seminar. Oh, I hope it's good. I got to get my credits. I can't believe she's making me go to this. <laughs> got a few of you out there, right? You didn't know it might be fun. You may learn something. See, reality is that self-affirmation. Those things attract. And I've been doing it over and over and over again. I want you to write something down here. It's called KiwiLive.com. KiwiLive.com. And what I've done, because i got so much information to share with you, is I can't possibly give it all to you right now. So I have put some gifts for you guys. Uh, Ultimate Software has been so good. I wanted to make sure you had books. But if you go to KiwiLive.com, and the password is Dr. Rick, so D-R, Rick, what you'll have there is every slide here, every slide that I'm going to go through. The other thing you're going to have is you're going to have a webinar. So it's, you're not going to see me talking. You're just going to hear me. So for those of you who, you know, I speak at 600 miles an hour with gusts up to 1,000. So if you're feeling like you've missed something, guess what? You just go there, put in the password, Dr. Rick, you'll have the webinar. You won't see me, but you'll have the webinar. The other thing I put up there is some of you've got assessments here that we're going to talk about how you handle conflict. So I knew that once you figured out how you did, you're going to want to give it to your spouse, significant other, and all your other team members. I know Mary, she's going to probably be a confrontational person. So, so let's see how she pans out. So what I've done is I put that assessment along with a communication style assessment and a couple of other ones so you can see how you perform, what you need to do to improve your communication a little bit. And the last thing I put up there was a video. Uh, it's one of my keynote speaks called, speeches called Striving for Excellence what we do and the people we touch. So, you know, it's a little bit of me getting more motivational with you. So I want to have those gifts and ult uh, ultimate soft. It was so good. I said, you know, let me put this up there. So you just go to KiwiLive.com. You can do it on your phone, on your laptop, whatever you want. I'm going to have it up there till the end of the month. And then June 30th, it's coming off. Okay. So it's just for you guys, time limited. Once you download it though, you got it forever. So you're good. All right. So let's talk about establishing rapport. People do business with people who they like who are like them. We want to attract people, especially when we're hiring people into our teams, you want to hire them into the culture of the team. And not everybody fits. I like exclusivity because doesn't everybody want what they can't have? So we want to test people that are coming into us versus just putting up that ad and seeing if anybody applies. So we take things, people through a stream of events to really see how important the job is to them. We may say, send, uh, send your resume in uh, to this email box, and what happens? People, people will call us up. Guess what? They didn't listen and follow directions. Shh, take them off the list. People will tell you in advance who they are. People will tell you in advance if you're going to have conflict. And we all know there's somebody out there that you saw that maybe you, you couldn't warm up to this person if you were cremated with them. Anybody have those people? You know, they're just the negative people. Maybe, you know, it's like someone licked all the red off their candy cane or something. You know, if they won the lottery, they complain about taxes. There are those people. You don't want them with you because it takes one person to drag a whole team down. And what I found, especially when I'm in the hiring phase with my team, I had 14 clinics in St. Louis. Kind of give you a little background. Um, I was a doctor for the St. Louis Rams. They were the worst team in the 90s. People forget that. They won the Super Bowl. I got out of St. Louis misery. Um, from that point, I started doing some business with AT&T and, and McDonnell Douglas. And had, I did the bur merger with McDonnell Douglas and Boeing. And then uh, Heineken became my biggest client because I really like beer. Um, not really. They just, they're just a fun group of people. Um, and Franklin Templeton Investments. And we have internet companies also advantage continue education seminars. So we do seminars for attorneys, accountants, construction, anything where you have to keep your license, we're in. So that's kind of what I do speaking uh, and dealing with truffles. Truffles is my dog. So she's a little Maltese. We call her Troubles. 
but that's what we deal with. So we like to build rapport, and you want to build rapport by connecting the dots. Who is the most important person to anybody in the world? Themselves, right? Don't you love you? Now, if I come in, I start saying, me, 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 me. Do you like me? No. I want to find out about Mark here. I want to know about Christina. I came right over, and I said, you're filling this stuff out. She's probably an A student. As soon as that paper hit, she, she wanted to know who she was. I saw a few of you out there filling it out. That was great. You'll have time to fill that out. Take a look at yourselves. It's about building rapport. So we want to build rapport on a regular basis. What do we want to look for? We want to look for solutions, right? We want to look for solutions. People pay you to fix things and come up with solutions. And we want to look for what is the solution. And again, most of the time, stress, putting out fires is right in front of our face and we miss the solutions. They're on the outside. I was just telling a story outside because uh, we had a little laptop issue with, a, with a, uh, one of the mic sticks. It wasn't taking on to the laptop for a presentation. I said, well, why don't we just use the laptop that Leslie has, you know, works on ours. Let's just switch it over. Well, it just reminded me of this story of a truck that got stuck under an underpass. And the truck was stuck under the underpass. They called the police. They called the firemen to get it out. Nobody can get it out. And little Johnny's in the car with his dad. And Johnny hops out of the car. And everybody's surrounding this. They're figuring, how can they get this big fire truck out? And Johnny looks right at it and says, why don't they let the air out of the tires? Real simple. See, some of the easiest challenges, some of the most difficult challenges have simple solutions. But when we're caught up in that area of stress, of panic, of the bullets are flying and you're ducking, you can't see that. Think about this. You've all seen somebody and you said, I know that person. I know that person. And it's driving you nuts. You can't think about it. And then you go to, you go to a home that night and you go, oh my gosh, that was Mary. I, she was my next door neighbor. Anybody have that happen? It's called pattern interruptions because there's so much going on right now that you know, you're being interrupted and sidetracked and having to multitask and stuff and you're not getting it all done and it causes stress. So we want to lay out what can we do, how can we look at things, and when we're having stress, you all have kids here, give yourself a time out. Have you ever needed a time out? Like you want to go out of the office and go, ah, just scream, let it all out, like every day sometimes, right? See, but that's good because you want to settle in. Why? Because the tongue has no eraser. And when you're upset, you do the thing that is the worst. You hit out at the first person you see whether it was them or not. It's just the way we react when we're upset. So we want to start to become more responders. So the solution is just the process of fixing things. We need to look for solutions and not focus on what hasn't happened because there's nothing you can do about that. So for instance, how many of you have had a situation where people play the blame game? Well, I didn't do it. I, it wasn't me. Do you know why? It's really simple. See, when I was growing up, if I did something wrong, I got punished and sent to my room. Now, how many of you were just children in big people's clothes? So when something goes wrong, you don't want to be punished and sent to your room. That was a bad thing. Just, it wasn't me. My family, it wasn't me. It wasn't my sister. It wasn't my brother. It was Yehudi. Yehudi was this invisible person who did everything in the house that we would not claim. And what I, what I found out about that was that, you know why people were lying and not you know, accepting responsibility? because they didn't want to get punished and sent to their room. See, I want to remove that angle, because I don't care what's happened. What I want to do is fix it and prevent it from happening again. Don't you? Because these things are going to come up over and over and over again. So you need to look at what happened here, what you're not going to do. And the only way we change is when it's so painful that you just can't stand it, then you change. You know, if you, if you, you know, you not want to go on a diet, and you say, I'm, yeah, I'm going to go on a diet maybe one day, when that button pops off your pants, you're like, pain, I'm going to start working on myself. And most people don't move away from anything until it's too painful. And you don't have to do that. You have to look for the different solutions, brainstorming with your team, getting those opportunities together, because if we're focused on the solution, people will focus on the solution. If we're focused on the blame, people are ducking for cover. And what I say to my team is, I don't care what's happened. What are we going to do to fix it and prevent it from happening again? And I will say that over and over so that they know I don't feed into the blame. There is nothing I can do about it. If I could go back and relive the last 30 years of my life, I might change a couple of things. All I could do is look forward, which is exactly what you could do. So start looking for those solutions. And when you start to see people playing the blame game, well, it wasn't me, it was her, you have to get into it. Who cares? It's not about that. It's about where we need to go. 
they will stop using blame over a period of time if they see that you're not focused on it. And here's the perfect example. For those of you who have had children and your child falls and starts to cry, and, well, maybe the child just falls, and you say, are you okay? Then what happens? The tears just like out, uh, outrageous. You know, now, if you say, you know, get up, you're fine, and you walk away, what do they do? They get up and walk away. So sometimes we're creating these issues, and people feed into them. They recognize it. Why? Because they feel that that type of behavior may get something for them, get them off the hook, etc. So don't buy into the blame game because it's one of the ones that you're just going to lose on a regular basis. Conflict is inevitable. You should want some conflict. Otherwise, things could get boring. Would you like if someone agreed with every single thing you did? I want somebody to be honest with me and say, no, you know, you should have done that or you could do this better if you want to improve yourself. And you've got to be willing to take that information in. See, how many of you believe in constructive criticism? Raise your hands. Okay. So let me give you a little constructive criticism, Kate. When I say that to you, what's the first word you hear? Thank you, Kate. What word do you hear when I say I'm going to give you some constructive criticism? What word? Yeah, yeah. Oh, boy. How many people hear criticism? Raise your hands. How do you like to be criticized? I know one thing about people. When you make a mistake, who beats yourself up more than you? Nobody. Nobody can beat you up worse than you. So now I come over and say, oh, okay, let me give you a little constructive criticism. She doesn't like me. She doesn't hear a word I said. And now the next time she's not going to do it for me. And she's telling everybody else, this guy's a real jerk. So I want to do something a little bit different because I know when I make a mistake, the first thing that pops into my head is a word, next time. So I use something called LBs and NTs. Write this down, LBs and NTs. LB stands for like best, NT stands for next time. So when I might come over to Kate and I say, you know, Kate, what I like best is you're, you're diligent, you're a team player, you get the job done. Next time, I would do this. What do you like best? What are you going to do different next time? When she verbalizes it and she decides what she's going to do next time, she owns it. It's no different. You could be the best worker on this planet. If I am standing behind your back, how many mistakes are you making? Tons of mistakes. Some of us are sitting here and there's actually somebody behind our back. We're feeling that pressure because, you know, the stuff's going on at work. So I want to use my LBs and NTs just because I want to tell them what I like best. Next time, do this. What do you like best? Because if she doesn't own it herself... She'll make that mistake over and over and over again. And what do we want to do? We want to focus on the good. Go catch someone doing good. Every day, I try to find my staff to do something good and say something. Another technique that I will use, um, and I just started using it regularly, and it's been so effective, is I went and ordered a bunch of personal notes. Uh, just says Dr. Rick Goodman at the top. I write notes and letters to everybody now. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Here's an article. You want to keep yourself top of mind. And people have gotten away from personal stuff. What are we doing? We're tweeting. We're texting. We're sending emails. Instead, it takes about two seconds to write, Dear Joe, appreciate meeting you. Thanks for talking to my mom last night on the phone. Dr. Rick. Now, if I send that to Joey over there, you know, you got famous people in this room. I don't know if you know this. Let Joey, Joey, come over here a second, Joey. Come on, come on. Joey over here works for Ultimate Software. He's an unbelievable guy. Joey is one of the most famous highlight players in the world. I'm not kidding you. I've lost so much money on this man. <laughs> and I didn't realize until so we were at dinner last night. And I said, you know, I said, uh, I said, he said, yeah, I used to live in Spain. And we talked, he said, yeah, I played highlight. I said, oh, really? We used, to, we used to love going to see this guy, Joey. My mom and I would go down and we always bet on him. I, and I wanted to see, and I was about to say, you know, I think it's fake sometimes. They drop that ball. It's like you're right there and they drop the ball. And he says, it's me. I'm Joey. <laughs> so I called up my mother. I go, Mom, you're not going to believe this. Joey is, remember Joey? She goes, oh, yeah, we used to bet on him all the time. I go, here, let's talk to him. Yeah. So we look at different things. How are you going to connect the dots? How are you going to look outside and bring solutions? That's my question. And remember, script these things out also. You want to start scripting things out. People think and hear things differently. So let's talk a little bit about that. Conflict is going to be inevitable. And your job, being able to handle the conflict constructively, is the key to your success. Your ability to confront is going to be directly proportional to your ability to be successful in life. So let me say that again, 
profound statement, your ability to confront is directly proportional to your ability to be successful. You have to have a high level of confront. That means if you don't ASK, you won't GET. What is the worst thing that can happen? Someone says no and you're in the same spot you were 30 seconds before. But I guarantee you've all been in a place where you wanted something, you said, ah, he or she's never going to go for it. They're not going to say yes. And they didn't. You could have been knocked over with a feather. So bring yourself back to those places. Start to ask and start to confront, why are these things happening? How can I help you to get over this hump? What can we do to do this differently? Start asking the open-ended questions where people have to give you an answer. Get them starting to think. Remember, sometimes we don't see how we respond to a situation. And the key is, are you willing to improve yourself if you don't like yourself? And that's key to growth, doing things a little bit differently. Do you know right now you guys are in the top 10% of all people in the world that most people, once they graduate college, never attend a continuing education seminar, webinar in their whole lives? You guys are in the top 10%. I mean, that's amazing that you're here growing and spending your valuable time here, which means I've got to give you some more information. So let's keep going. It's considered one of the more difficult communication skills, so we know nobody likes conflict, yet it's in front of us and we have to learn how to master it. So I want you to think of it as almost a game, and that game is to get people to change their state. Conflict is good. So if we have a commitment to organizational goals and people are really involved, there's going to be conflict because two people are going to see something differently. And you're going to want to brainstorm those ideas because you never know when that golden idea is going to pop up. And it may come out of left field. And it usually comes after you're sitting there and you've got all these different things. So how many of you have brainstormed solutions for challenges before? Raise your hands. Okay. How many of you have made this mistake? I've made it a million times. When, let's say, we get somebody, Christina comes up and, and she says, well, this is my idea. And I say, good, good, good idea. And Kayla says, this is a good idea. And Bob will say, this is a great, great idea. And then we come over to Heidi and I don't say great idea. What is she thinking? Her idea is not so good. I didn't like it. I stopped acknowledging because what was I doing? I was there judging. I was making the call as opposed to letting the group decide which is the best way to go. It's a common mistake we all do, you know? So I'll just put something up there. I'll just write up on the board. I was doing a job for Johnsonville Foods. You know Johnsonville Foods? Johnsonville Bratwurst and stuff? Love them. I love it too. Well, do you know the secretary of the company uh, walked up to the president 15 years ago? And she said, you know what we need? She said, we need to have a brochure to sell all of our products and stuff like that. He said, go ahead and do it. The secretary of the company is running an $8 million product line. Because she asked. She went in there and did the work. They were brainstorming ideas. They couldn't figure out. And she said, I got this great idea. He said, go with it. So when you're brainstorming solutions on how to do things, throw it up there. Just throw it up there. And here's what I do. I do something called the fist of five. So you want to write this down. The fist of five is a consensus decision-making process. And it goes like this. If we're all in 100% agreement, we all raise our hands. So everybody raise your hands. Everybody raise your hands. Great. So you got your hands up. Five fingers up means I'm 100% with me. And you put your hands down. Now I hold up four fingers. And four fingers means I'm with you. I'm not 100% with you. But I'm not going to prevent the team from going forward. There may be somebody up there with three fingers. And that means I'm on the fence. Now it is going to be my job to find out that W-I-I-F-M. You listen to that radio station, right? 97.3 on your dial, W-I-I-F-M, what's in it for me? That's what they want to know. I have to show them how it's going to be better for them, make life smoother, we're going to have a learning curve, but it's going to continually improve. So I've got to kind of address that issue. And then there's that person with a fist up, and the fist up means no way I'm not going to do it. Now, here is the key phrase when we are getting consensus with our teams and we're, we're brainstorming a solution, a conflict, and it works like this. It says, can you live with it? See, I found something else out. Some of you may not like things. They not, may not be the best things that you have to do at work, but you could live with it. When we have a conflict that's based on someone's moral fiber or something goes on with them, you can't overcome that. Now, the reason why I do the fist of five is some people are introverted, some people are extroverted, and it's just what's so. There's nothing right or wrong with it. My biggest concern is the people that don't talk. Then you don't know where they stand. So we all had to learn to raise our hands in school, didn't we? 
So now when I do the fist of five, I have a visual. I know who's 100% with me. I know who's with me and not preventing me from going forward. I know who's on the fence, and I know who's against me. My concern is not with the people that are completely with me or the people that are not going to prevent me from going forward. My, my fo focus is the people on the fence and the people against me. Those are the people that I've got to shift over in order to get the process moving because it takes one person to stop a project. And sometimes they'll stop it because of different reasons. When we were doing the, um, the merger with Boeing and McDonnell Douglas, there were two supervisors that play, they both were baseball coaches. And one of the kids, uh, one of the dads, his team was really good and the son was pitching and uh, the other kid's team wasn't so good and they ran up the square like 25 to three. And you know, the supervisor was upset. Well, he held up production in the plane line. He wouldn't move things through and sell it to the other supervisor because he was mad because his son got beat. These things happen all the time. So we want to be able to address them in a way that's going to be good and productive. It could be challenging and stimulating. So like I say, make conflict resolution a game. It's like getting someone to put a smile on their face, changing their state. Whatever you can do, because if they're in that non-working state, they're not going to be motivated, and you have no shot at motivating them. Conflict is also going to be addressed, on the other hand, could be destructive, if we make it personal. So the one thing that I always say in our organization, business is business, it's not personal. Now, does that always make sense to the person sitting across the table? They still feel it's personal. So I want to make sure to not address those names, especially if I say you, or I use their name, all of a sudden they're getting defensive. They're feeling like they're going to be attacked. So psh, defenses drive up. They don't hear one thing that you say, it goes in one ear and out the other, and then you turn around, you don't like them. So I want to be inclusive about handling the conflict. And I want to find out what has to happen in order for you to get the job done, or what has to happen in order for you to be satisfied or for us to fix this. When I ask that question, what has to happen, what they do is they give me their rules. And you all have rules. Your rules say, you know, I do this because of this, or I won't join this organization because of this. You have rules. We call them rituals. How you start your day is your ritual. I always say you could spell the word Smith, S-M-I-T-H, S-M-Y-T-H, S-M-I-T-H-E. I don't care how you spell it as long as you can say Smith. But we all do things a little differently. And that's your process and your ritual to get things done. Sometimes it comes in conflict with the people that are managing you. They may do things a different way. So we want to find out exactly how we move forward, what we are able to do, and how we work. And a lot of that comes down to our corporate culture. You know, whether it's a, a communicative corporate culture, a team type of culture, or maybe it's just a, you know, person at the top, dictatorial, authoritative culture. So all those different things are going to play a role in how you're going to handle conflict. But the better we develop our skills, obviously, it's going to contribute to good health, because when you're stressed out and you're going to work and your blood pressure's up, or you just had uh, an argument with the kids and the whole day is going to go downhill, you're going to show up at work and the first person asks you a question, you're going to growl at them. And they didn't do anything wrong. They were just that person that was there to get it. Okay? So some of the ingredients of conflict are values. Like I said before, if you have a value-related conflict, that's something that goes against their moral value. Let's say you decided you're going to open up on Sundays, and a lot of the people, that's their day off. They want to spend it with their families. That person says they're not coming in. You are not going to be able to overcome that person's value. When we get involved in the hiring process, one of the things I say to people is, where do you see yourself five years from now? Now, if this person's right out of college and they say, well, I want to eventually run the company and do this, and I know family-owned business, not going to happen. So I want to see values because you can't overcome the value issue. Can't do it. It's almost, I won't say it's impossible, it's improbable to move people because that's someone's core values. The values and beliefs, they're considered whole important, okay? Serious conflicts are going to arise when we start to address people's values. People will leave you, they will, or they may show up, and then they will sabotage you. Anybody work with backstabbers? Okay. So the, the silent killer. So you've got to look at how to establish rapport with these people. Conflicts are also going to arise when one refuses to accept that the other party has different values. And that's what happens in, in the country, in America. That's why we get consensus, and we ask the question, can you live with it? Because if we take a vote, what happens? The majority wins, the minority loses. Does the minority want to follow along? No, they lost. 
They, didn't have a, they, did, they felt like they didn't have a say-so. Also, if you're dealing with decisions within your team, you must make sure that everybody on the team has a say-so. Because the one person who may have been on vacation or not showed up or didn't have an opportunity to say so, that's the first person to sabotage you. Whether they like the idea or not because they haven't been included. The companies that grow the biggest are the companies that include the people in decision making. They ask the frontline people because those people know how to do it. When I set up uh, team building, self-directed work teams at McDonnell Douglas and Boeing in St. Louis, the first thing I did was say, you guys know what's going on. I had people in Mahogany Row. So I wanted the people that did the job to be empowered to run the job because they know more than the people that are disconnected. And that's how we built that company where they could merge and move forward quickly because we empowered the people. And that was after they came off of a 99-day strike. So imagine the conflict of a 99-day strike. I showed up, and two days before I got there, the vice president of the company said, I can hire people from 7-Eleven that could do your job. Now, if you've been building jet fighter planes and missiles, and someone says, I can hire the guy who made the Slurpee and the Big Gulp to do your job, would you be happy? I thought the first day, I said, listen, you guys are going to be empowered. We're going to allow you to make decisions. I walked out of there. If I drank a cup of water, it was just spewing out from the bullet holes. But it took references. We had to change their references first. In order to get someone moved forward, you have to change their references. And your references are like the top of a table. So the top of a table is kind of flat here. So here we got the table. Your top of the table is your experience. And the legs of the table are your references, OK? If you've had a number of negative references, you're going to have a negative experience. And if you've had a number of positive references, you're going to have a positive experience. Does this make sense? Right? So how do we change all these people coming off of a strike, negative, 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 negative? Okay? Well, we have to give them a positive. We have to give them something that they're going to be able to achieve and feel good about themselves. So what I did was I instituted a program which I didn't know was around. And the program was a program of giving people benefits and giving people um, commissions on saving money. So what we found was there were 80,000 rivets used in a jet fighter plane, and these rivets were solid. They cost about $2.25 a piece. And these guys came up with an idea, and they said, Rick, listen, we, you, we've been testing these other, um, these other rivets, and they're hollow. They cost about a buck. They're lighter. They're more compliant. I don't think this is work. Well, 80,000 rivets, they saved millions of dollars in rivets. Well, the team submitted their response, and what happened in the, back in the day was the supervisor would say, no, this won't work. The supervisor would then take the idea, submit it themselves, and get the money. Well, when I found out about this, I'm like the little guy for obvious reasons. Uh, so I decided I wanted to go and help them out, so I fought for them, and each one of these guys got a $10,000 bonus. Well, hey, all of a sudden, we changed one of the legs of their table, and we gave them this positive leg. But they said, Rick, this is not going to last. They're going to you know, still do the same thing. I said, let's come up with another idea. So we came up with an idea on how to mentor people, and that was in the missile panel. And the missile panel is a panel that you put together that goes inside the missile. And there was one woman whose cycle time was like four hours. She could bang it out. And another guy was like about 24 hours. So we set up a mentoring program where this woman uh, would just follow the superstar for a week, not doing anything, asking, observing, writing down. See, most people are visual. If we could see it, touch it, and taste it, we got it. If they just tell it to you, you can't really see it. Then the next week, we gave her a panel to do. And she was able to meet back with that person three times a week in the second week for one hour a day. Why? Because that superstar is not going to be 100% productive if someone's following them around, and they get stressed out. So what we're doing is basically pushing you out on the diving board, pushing you off into the deep end, but we have a life preserver around you. You're not going to drown. And then in the third week, they're on their own. They're allowed to meet back with that mentor one time, one hour, as agreed upon by both of them. Cycle time dropped down to eight hours from 24 because they saw it happening. It built the team. Now that new employee who's just been onboarded has faith, confidence, and belief in the system We've just changed their reference again to a positive reference, and boom, what happens? More positive references, we change the experience. That's what it's going to take. It takes that with your children. It takes that with your business. It takes that with, with everything that you do. You've got to start to fo focus on how do I change their references, because that's the only way it's going to change their experience. So how many, have, how many people here have teenagers? Raise your hands. Okay. So for those that have teenagers, um, I know that you're going to make a comeback, okay? Well, 
my, uh, <clears throat> my wife was very sick. She had cancer for eight years of our 10-year marriage. And she said to me, you really need to get out. You need to go somewhere with your daughter, take her away, because guys focus on their sons. And, you know, I go to all the ball games with my son. He's seen all the players and all that stuff. Well, I decided I was going to take her away. And I was going to take her away for 24 days to Europe by myself. And I was going to write a book about it. She's 16 years old. It was called The Dad's Guide to Traveling with a Teenage Daughter, Generation Y. Like, why would you do it, right? <laughs> but here's the crux. She couldn't bring her cell phone or computer. Ooh. She had to deal with me. Shh. Well, as we went through Europe and we had different experiences, pretty crazy experiences, uh, 1.30 in the morning, we're walking through Florence, Italy, and she grabs my hand. She said, Dad, we make a great team. It was the best thing I ever did. She came back. I said, let's see what we both wrote. She wrote magnificently. And the book became her book. It became Jamie's Journey Travels with My Dad. So who's got, who's got a 16-year-old here? You do? Here you go. You will make a comeback, Jennifer. <laughs> what she does is she gives advice to other kids. Hey, you know when your dad's annoying? Hang in there. You may learn something. And then there's my revelations. Make your plans and be flexible and break them. Because the night before we left for Europe, she called me up and she said, uh, Dad, uh, no offense. Have you ever gotten a no offense line? Uh, no offense, uh, but I want to hang out with my friends. I had to rebook a hotel, change a flight, because I, I thought I was going to be there, help her get through this. No. We're so close now. She just called me a few minutes ago. She calls me every day, looks after me. We have a conversation now. And that's a lot different than we had before. And it was just about doing it. And you know what? I was on this mom and me, uh, momandme.com. It's a worldwide talk show. She satellites it out. Um, and good show. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll go on that show. Accomplish what we decided to do at the beginning of the meeting. Good meeting. Wasn't a waste of time. I don't want to call people in if we don't make a decision. They don't know what it's about. I want to lay it out so they know their time is just as valuable as mine. Dysfunctional conflict. It's when it hinders the group's performance. There's really not, not enough say. That's where you've got to limit. Take a look at the personalities in the group. I've got this issue going on right now. Heineken, my biggest, uh, one of my biggest uh, clients, I was just down in St. Martin. They took over the airport concession. So when you get off of a cruise ship or a plane, every liquor, every perfume, every sunglass, every bottle of wine, that's all, they run the whole thing. So I went down there because we set up these beautiful princess promenade shops with high-end chocolates and all stuff. So when you get in the airport, you'll see there, it's gorgeous. And we had one person on the team that was put in a position of authority but wasn't doing anything. She was a teller. Anybody work with tellers? They tell everybody what to do? Okay, so she was a teller. And she would sit back in the office as opposed to getting out there and working side by side with the team. When you get out there and work side by side with your team, you earn respect. People are going to be there for you. They know where you came from. My grandmother always says she was so proud of me because when I was 17, I was a garbage man in the morning and a lifeguard in the afternoon because in Long Island, a garbage man's a political job. So if your dad knows somebody, you get to work on the back of a truck. But she would always say, you know what, it wasn't beneath you to do that. My friend Alicia called me last week down in Florida and she said, yeah, I told my mom I'm going to see you. And she said, oh, the garbage man? Because that's what a mother remembers. I go up and say, hey, uh, I'm here, Ms. Rosenfeld. Can I get your garbage on Saturday? When you're willing to do everything that you ask the people to do on your team, you will limit conflict in a monster way. And how you ask people to help you makes a difference. See, how many of you want to be told what to do? Raise your hands. Anybody? See, you were like me when you were 15, 16 years old. You said, you know what? Can't wait to get out of my mother's house. Nobody's ever going to tell me what to do again. How many, how many of you like that, right? I know it. I'm that guy. We're just big people in, in you know, little people in big people's clothes. That's what happens. See, but if I ask you for help, there's something else I know about people here in Washington State. You guys are so damn nice, it's ridiculous. So if I ask you for help, 90% of you will say, sure. Maybe a few people say, it depends. And one person, who I don't think is in this room, will say, no. And I don't want to do business with them anyhow. But most people, when you say, you know, I, need your, I really need your help, could you please do this for me? They're there right for you. So let me give you a, a technique that I think is one of my favorite techniques. It's called check back, okay? So write this down. Check back. It is not check up. How do you feel if someone's checking up on you? 
micromanage, they don't trust you, they don't think you could do the job. And remember, if we're standing behind people's backs, they make all kinds of mistakes. So now I come over to Christina, I say, Christina, I need you to get this job done for me. And she says, okay. Now, two, three hours later, I say, uh, Christina, did you get that job done? She, oh, Rick, let me tell you something. These people are crazy here. Heidi was giving me a hard time. And this person, and what is she doing? Make excuses, blame, et cetera, et cetera. So this happened to me a number of times. So now instead, I'm going to say, Christina, I need you to get this job done for me. When can I check back with you? So she'll, now the ball's in her court. So she'll say, you can check back with me in a couple of hours. Great. Now I get out of her way. See, I used to be the type of guy who would give my staff 10 things to do. I'd go in my office for about an eighth of a second. I'd come up and give you another 10 things to do. I'd drive you nuts. Why do you think I went, lost 200 people? Who was I hurting? Me. Because I wasn't allowing the people to do the job that was going to help me. I was interrupting them. And remember, your brain is like a record album. You've all seen somebody that you know, and you can't remember their name for the life of you, and then you remember. It's like a scratch in a record, and it just jumps over. It's a pattern interruption. So now she says, you can check back with me in a couple hours. Now she comes and makes all kinds of excuses. When someone makes all kinds of excuses, what's the one question you're going to ask? And here it goes. Your children are upstairs. You tell them, go upstairs, clean up your room. Hour later, you go up, the room's not cleaned up. What's the first question you ask? Why? Anybody who says, what were you doing? I was picking my nose. When you ask that question, what were you doing? You can't go any farther than that. You're at a dead end. It's all about the why. People do things for the why, don't they? They don't just do things because. So now I'm going to give Christina a job, and I'm going to check back with her. Now, here's the key. If you don't check back, you lose all credibility. How many times have you had someone in your life say, drop everything you're working on, I want you to get it done right now. They, you do, you drop everything, you get it done, and they don't use it for a week, a month, or ever. Right, Kate? And what did you say to yourself, Kate? The next time, because we're human, this is what we do. So, right, so you've got to make sure to check back. Now, let's say I give her a task, and I say, I need you to get this done a couple, uh, you know, in a couple hours, or four, a couple hours, and she says, well, you know, I've got all these things to do. I've, I've got things going on. I'll say, Christine, I really need your help. I really appreciate it. If you can get this done for me, it would mean so much. Could you get that done for me? Thanks so much. We have, an, we have, we have agreement, right? When I shake her hand, that locks it. Because you know what? I know who Christina is. She's somebody who wants her reputation good. She wants to do a great job. She is going to bust her butt to get it done because she's now made that commitment. And that's the way I work it. I want to make sure that they've made that commitment. Is that fair? I will say, is that fair? No, it's not fair. Lie to me. I would say to a patient, if I can help you, I'll let you know. And if not, I'll let you know that too. Is that fair? I want to ask those questions. It's going to give me a closed-ended answer. And I'm going to make sure to check back. It is one of the best techniques that you could ever use. Because a lot of times we delegate, people forget. And I don't want to be on top of people. So I put the ball in their court. And then it's up to them to respond effectively. Does that make sense? OK. So let's talk about intentions. Intentions from the, form the basis of decisions. I'm going to say most people have the right intent. You're going to have a couple of people. It's the 80-20 principle, you know, Pareto's principle, 80-20. You know, I say it's 80, 10, and 10. 80% of the people uh, on the earth are great. 10%, you could take a leave. 10% of the crabgrass that grows on the earth, you get rid of that 10%, another 10% come in. It's just like that. And what happens when we're dealing with people? Who do we focus on? The 10%, exactly. I could have 99 patients come in in a day. 100 patients, 99 say you're great, one person says you're the worst doctor, you're a quack, who do I focus on? The one. Now I focus on the 99. I can't change or sway that one. They'll eventually drop off and another one will come in. It's the way life works. Focus on the people doing the good job. Remember, everybody wants what they can't have. And then praise them. Catch them doing the right thing. When you catch people doing the right thing, it limits conflict. You start to build a culture of people looking for people doing the right thing to praise them. And I do it in public. I praise in public, discipline in private. Because if you ever discipline someone in a public setting, whether that person is right or wrong, the whole team is going to turn against you. Because if they could do it to them, who's going to be next, right? See, a lot of the heads raised because it happens all the time. So let's talk about behavior. Conflicts become visible and behavior is visible. So that's when someone, you walk over and say, are you okay? I'm fine. There's nothing wrong with me. Really? I walked into my office one day, and my staff said, go in the bathroom and fix your face. I said, no, I got patients in the room. She said, go in the bathroom and fix your face. Well, I walked in the bathroom, and I looked. I must have had a scowl, probably had an argument with my ex or something like that. 
You can't heal if you're not happy. I don't want to put somebody through a table. So I went back out, and Donnell said, fix your face. And that's what I do, because are you going to be 100% if you're not, your head's in another place? And when you go to work, when you show up with clients, you've got to be on stage. No matter what is going on in my life, when I get up here, it's boom. Because I have to give you information, serve you, help you. And if I'm not feeling all me, you don't care about that, do you? Because it's your time. So we have to think about that. People don't want to hear all those issues, especially at work when they come in, oh, this is going to... And you know the people. The, 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 the people that like, uh, has the cloud, proverbial cloud over their head as they come in. Everybody runs. We had someone... Her name was Marianne, Marianne Finnerty, never forget, great patient, complained. Everybody couldn't stand Marianne. People would pick straws to see who got stuck with Marianne. So I called Donnell, I said, we need to do something. We've got to change Marianne's state. Marianne had migraine headaches for 35 years. Would you be upset if you had migraine headaches every day for 35 years? So would I. Well, Marianne, we started treating her, I started doing some acupuncture, we did some different things. And one day, Marianne came in, and she brought us a big box of cookies. And she had a different look on her face because people are in pain. You could see it on their face. And she said, you know, I didn't have a migraine headache for the last two days. And then she started bringing in theater tickets. Then the staff started saying, I get Marianne. Everybody wanted her. Her state was changed because maybe she was in a little pain or something. Sometimes the people that you're in conflict with or having conflict, there's other things going on in their life. It is not you. You're not that important. I'm sorry. It's about them. There's something going on in their lives that's making them get out there. As a friend, as an employee, as a team member, you want to see if you can help them. Is there anything I can help you with? You see, you know, anything you want to share with me? But it's about them. It's not about you. Because they'll snap and then all of a sudden they'll come and apologize because they're not being all they can be. So we've got to recognize that, you know. Let them know. If you see that type of person or if you see that person that isn't in that state, have them change their state. When I was in California, I was going to pick up uh, my wife point in time, and she was coming in on a plane. I just got done doing a seminar, and I was going to speak over in Hawaii. And I love going over there. I went to this winery, Arrowwood Wine. Well, I walked in, 4.45, and the lady said, well, you're not going to be able to do a tasting. We're getting ready to close. I said, what's the matter? Did someone look all the red off your candy cane today? Well, she got a little smirk in her mouth, because I'm just going to be confront, confront. I, I said, yeah, I love this wine. I came all the way over. I was in Boston. I spoke here. I'm going to pick up, uh, you know, my girlfriend. I'm going to get engaged in Hawaii. Oh, really? We're going to Hawaii. Oh, I speak in the Pacific Beach Hotel. I speak there every year. Really? Next thing you know, I'm there 530. I've tried every wine. This woman's happy. I took her from a mad state to a happy state to where she said, here, look us up. We're going to be staying at this hotel. Let's get together when we're in Hawaii. It should be a game. When you make changing someone's state, getting them to go from sad to happy, and you make it a game, it becomes more fun. It really does. And that's where, that's where your talent comes in. How can I turn this person? How can I make them a little different? How can I change their state? How can I get them to smile? And sometimes it's self-deprecating yourself gets them to smile. See, because if you could laugh at yourself, then you have a really good self-image. And, and it's funny. Life is funny out there. Start observing. I mean... After this, we could all go out there and, and go ride some goats. You guys want to ride some goats? You, know, you got goats back here, right? Yeah, the, the goats are eating the grass. It's very high technology stuff here. Okay, so the conflicts are going to come in with a behavior. A lot of times you're going to see stalemates. You've got to overcome that. The best way to overcome that, change their state, okay? So some conflict management techniques. We talked about check back, okay? Check back is my favorite technique because it's not check up. It's getting out of that person's way, letting them do the job. And then what technique should we come in with after that? Are we going to constructively criticize? No, we're going to use LBs and NTs. You know what I like best is next time do this. Praise them. Or call them up front and say, you know what? Patty was just put under pressure. She just did the most amazing job. I love Patty. Because everybody wants that. Get involved with giving people certificates and applauding them. Little things like that make a huge difference. Every month I do a Franklin Templeton video for these guys and I do the leaderboard, just like a PGA event, and they love seeing their face up there. So anything that you can do, and it's generally, doesn't have to be monetarily because you know what, what are they going to do with the money? They're going to pay a bill. I want to give something that they can't take away or give to somebody else. Whether it's a plaque, a personal note, all these things make the big difference because 
People will stay with you longer if they like you than anything else. If they don't like you and you give them another dollar 25 an hour, they're going to still leave. But if they like you, they have a belief system, they'll be there forever. So let's talk about the three F's, another great technique for handling conflict. Three F's is feel, felt, and found. Now, this is the way that we can get in rapport with people. Because how many people have said to you, well, you just don't understand how I feel? Anybody ever have that retort? Well, you don't know how I feel. You're not, you're not in my body, right? So I want to take somebody through an experience because some of you don't know that I might have been through certain experiences. And I can relate because one thing I know about conflict, misery loves company. Have you ever been there? Oh, yeah, you know, I, I can top your misery story. You think you got it bad, you know? So I want to use this technique. And here's kind of how it works. When I say I understand how you feel, the first thing I do is I kind of disarm that person. Really? I felt that way, too. Now I'm going to tell a story of when I had that situation. I found that, and I'm going to give them what I did to fix it. So here's how it goes. Uh, well, I went to Kent State, I, played, I didn't really go to college, I played hockey, so I had a really cool schedule, but I went to college there, and um, I had a music, history of music class, came right before hockey practice. If I had that class 100 times, I missed it 51 out of 100, I got an F. It put me to sleep. Well, I had to go to class in the summer to raise my grade point, because I wanted to go to medical school, and you know, I wasn't getting in there with the F in music. So I took history of film, underwater basket weaving, coaching volleyball, any fluff course over the summer to get that grade point average back up. Well, my son was coming down to Florida, and he was getting ready to go on a cruise with his mom, and he had straight A's in math. He's brilliant in it. He could do it behind his back. And as a 15-year-old, he's excited because he's going on a cruise. So he's telling me all about the cruise and everything. I said, Alex, listen, here's the deal. You got one test left. You got an A in the class. Just stay focused. And then you got your vacation. Well, what do you think my 15-year-old's doing? He's not listening to me. I'm dumb as dirt at this point in time. I don't know what I'm talking about. They forget I was actually 15 at one point. Well, sure enough, he goes and takes the test. He gets a 64, fails the test, drops his grade point from an A to a B minus, and I get the note from the teacher. You know, dear Alex, I know you had this grade there. I know you're going to be a little bit upset with yourself, um, but it's obvious you really didn't focus on the final. Well, he comes back from the cruise, and I'm going to meet him at the airport. And my ex calls me up, she's like, don't say anything to him. You know that's like green light for me to say something. So I get him over and I said, Alex, uh, come on, I want to talk to you about something. And I showed him his report card and I said, you know, you definitely didn't focus on the test, you didn't get it done. I said, I know how you feel. I said, because I had the same situation, you know, when I tell him about the music class. I said, no, I, you know, I felt that way too. And then the lesson came, it's easier to maintain a high grade point than to make a comeback from a bad grade. It is, right? That's the lesson I learned. Why? Because I had to do the time to learn that lesson. It was so painful for me. And don't we want to uh, help our children avoid some of the pains that we had? Although we recognize they have to go through it in order to grow just like we did. So although we want to pull back, sometimes we can't pull back. Because they have that growth experience. And for some of you who can't pull back, I'm sure your children are confronting you, saying, leave me alone, like my son did a few weeks ago. I always want to give advice. He said, he said yeah, I met this guy, uh, and he works on production. So I said, did I tell you about my friend Bobby Gilliam? He's the head guy. Dad, why does it have to be about you? I'm thinking connecting dots. I'm not thinking, I'm not getting the job. So we have to let some of that stuff go and, and go up. The feel, felt, and found is a tremendous, tremendous technique, because it's so simple. I understand how you feel. I felt that way, too. When I first started this job, it was really a struggle. I didn't know if I was going to know all the computer systems, all that. And I found that when I worked with Mary on this, that I got boom, 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 boom. Now you've taught a lesson, you've alleviated stress, and you've bonded with that person. So you've done all three. So I love that technique, feel, felt, and found. Okay. Next is a problem-solving technique. So problem-solving, brainstorming, we're just trying to get it all figured out. Real simple. Subordinate goals, that's what I'm going to do when I don't know what, I, what to do. If I am not that expert in it, I'm going to bring someone in there. I'm going to put them in charge. I'm going to delegate it out. There's so many things right now with technology that can be delegated out simply and effectively that you don't even have to put your time and energy and effort into it, and it's going to save your time. If you're working on low-value dollar projects and you're a high-value dollar person, 
You're not working on the business. What you're doing is working in the business. And there's a great book for that called The E-Myth. Anybody read The E-Myth? Okay, great book. So The E-Myth is the entrepreneurial myth, which it talks about working on your business versus in your business. And in the business is the busy stuff, the day-to-day -day stuff, not building relationships, not growing, not interacting. That's not there, okay? Next, conflict management, expansion of resources. So we expand our resources. We're going to bring more people on, more money, more promotion. Now, some of us don't have the opportunity to do that in order to get things done. Avoidance, this is the worst place to be. You don't want to be an avoider. Remember, we want to be that person who's confronted. How many of you at this point have taken that, um, taken a little assessment? Raise your hands. Anybody take the assessment? Okay, so a few of you. Real important to take that assessment today. I'm going to be talking a little bit about the styles. The key is know who you are. That's what I always say. Know who you are, what style you're at now, and you can shift that and change that to a more favorable style. Okay? Smoothing, that's just when we're trying to smooth over differences. But remember, the brain and the tongue does not forget. So although some people may not be able to move on, you need to see that. If you have an employee that's in that position and they just can't get past the conflict, they just can't get past that chemistry situation, the best thing you could do is let them go so they could be successful somewhere else. That's what you do. I just had my assistant 13 years with me, Shirley. I just let her go because I knew she seemed to me she was doing time. She wasn't into it anymore. She wanted to spend more time with her kids. And I said, you know what? I said, here's what I've done for you. I said, I sent you to real estate school. I said, and I taught you how to edit film and you make great videos for me. I said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to call up a few of my friends. I said, you know, she just became pregnant, so she's got another kid coming in, three under five. I said, you've got a business. I said, I'm going to set you up in business. I said, because you can edit all these movies. People need that. I'm going to give you 10 speakers that want to have videos and stuff. You go over, they probably make more money than they're making with me, and you get to pick up your kids and see your kids and make your own schedule. This is like an opportunity that I'm giving you. She sort of was like, you're letting me go. I sort of, no, you know what? I'm letting you grow. That's the difference. It's not about letting people go. It's about letting them grow. Let them grow somewhere else. What do you want people to say about you when they see you walking down the block 20 years from now? Do you want them to say, oh, you know what? Kevin was a great leader. He was a great supervisor. He showed me how to do this. Or do you, they want to walk away from you. Like, I don't want to see that person. What is it that you want? Because you've got to decide that. That's going to drive how you manage things, how you communicate with people, and how you handle conflict. Because people remember the pain, don't they? They remember that touching the fire, you know, touching the, uh, the stove and burn. They remember those things. Altering the human variable, sometimes bringing in other people to handle conflicts, mediation. So we've got our mediator over here. Sometimes I'm not the best person to get in there and mediate. Sometimes we need somebody else, a third party to make sense, to say, hey, you two knuckleheads need to figure this out. I already solved the problem. Why? Because they're on the outside looking in. They're in phase three. They're on top of that helicopter looking down on the situation. Authoritative management, where management is formal authority, they come in. And this worked great back in the day. Here's the issue. People have developed. People have grown. Technology's changed. People have changed. So most of us don't want someone telling us what to do. That great dictator isn't effective. Compromise. When we compromise, we're giving up a little bit of what we want. And that's okay for the short term. The problem with leaders who compromise all the time and give things away all the time, they start to become resentful and angry, and the team feels that you're giving it away and not supporting them. And that's so important. The team has to feel that you've got their back covered, the people that you work with. If you don't, they're going to leave you. Altering structural variables, so that's sometimes just changing some person in the team, changing the structure, moving people around, maybe making up different teams. I like to move people around when we're at the office so that everybody's not sitting in the same spot because what happens? If we left the room and we came back tomorrow, it was a two-day program, you'd all gravitate to the same seats. And if someone was sitting in that seat, you'd get upset. It's like, you, that's your seat, Archie Bunker's chair, right? So we want to make sure that when we alter the structure of variables, it doesn't throw everything off. We want to do it with intent. And sometimes it's just some people work better than others together. We sometimes mix the teams together based on what we're trying to accomplish. 
So communication using ambiguous, threatening messages is not going to work. Okay? I speak at the third grade, second semester level, so my college professors get it. Have you ever been to a doctor's office and you're speaking so above your head you don't know what they're talking about? How many of you walked out of a meeting and, and stood around the water cooler and said, do you know what he's talking about? Do you know what he's talking about? Anybody been there before? And then you get the dummy straw. Someone picks a short straw, and they get to go walk on in, and they say, okay, Christina, what were you saying? And she's like, are you kidding me? You were there the whole time. So I want to make sure that everybody understands things because <laughs> conflict starts when people don't understand. So if you're in a meeting, you're running that meeting, and you look around, and there's people with the deer in the headlights look, I don't say, well, obviously you're not getting it, because what do they think? I'm attacking them. So I'll say, you know, obviously, you know, I think, is everybody with me? Is anybody lost? And that's what I say. Is everybody with me? Is anybody lost? And then I scan. And I'm looking for the deer in the headlights, like I got three heads or something like that. Let me go over it again. And then I will go over it again. I don't want anybody to leave the meeting without a clear idea of what we were talking about. So I make sure to do that. And I don't pick on one person. It's general. Is everybody with me? Is anybody lost? And if I see I, or I feel in my gut, and here's key, listen to your gut. We say that to the whole staff. I will say to all my staff, what does your gut say? Because that's the multiple choice test in school. You remember that? And you change your answer from what? The right one to the wrong one. Whatever Jiminy Cricket says is generally right. You go against it. It's going to blow up in your face. So listen to that gut. Okay? Bringing in outsiders, this is the number way to kind of destroy a team, cause conflict, or better yourselves. So it could go either way. That's why I like to have the staff involved with that situation. I like to promote from within because the people have earned it. When you throw somebody in from the outside, the communication's not there, especially in an established team. So, you know, you've all been working and it kind of breaks up your click a little bit. Okay? Restricting the organization, so sometimes when we alter rules and regulations, we cause interdependence, it's going to remain in conflict. If we could keep everything exactly the same right now, you would make the same amount of money, nothing would change, most of you would say, that's just all right with me, right? Change is good. Nobody in this room has that big cell phone that you could knock someone out with, it look like a brick, right? So we have to evolve the change, and what you have to do is give the people the references. Well, do you remember when we had that? We didn't think we could do it, and now we did it. See, because every time you overcome one of those obstacles, you're going to go to the next level. You will never fall back down to that bottom level once you've started to expand and change. Use those examples. Use your feel, felt, and found when you're making a change. Hey, I understand how you feel. When I started working at this company, we only had one computer and, you know, couple of staples, and I was, you know, worried, and I saw that they supported us, and I found that they were going to be behind us and training us and working us, and I found that if this works for me, you should just focus because we're going places. Now they get to, okay, I feel better. Kate's been there, done that. Remember, that's a very powerful technique because it bonds, it brings people in close, it teaches them a lesson. You've been there before, okay? Three classes of conflict, so we have individual conflict, conflict with one another person, Organizational conflict and inter-organizational conflict. And this is when we have a couple different teams from different departments that are fighting for resources. Um, happens all the time. So we want to be aware of these different types. 